Welcome to Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you for joining us. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. New York has the third largest state economy in the U.S. New York City is a major contributor to the state's revenues, so I pay close attention to trends that affect the city's economy and the city's finances. Today I'll be discussing a number of issues that affect residents of New York, including housing and immigration. My first guest, public advocate Jumani Williams, was chosen by voters in February from a field of 17 candidates. As a member of the city council, he was a passionate fighter for his home borough of Brooklyn. As public advocate, he now has a citywide constituency. Jumani Williams, public advocate, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. That was quite a process in February, going through all those candidates, and you won by a big, big plurality of the vote. It was definitely quite a process. That's a good word, a good combination <laughs> of words for it. Um, I'm, I'm just honored to have won. Uh, it's obviously nice to have that kind of number, but I would have taken 50% plus one if I, yeah. if I can do it. Yeah. And, uh, because of that great victory, you don't have a primary. I think it helped. I think yeah. uh, we had a, a, a nice margin, and we don't have a primary in June. Yeah. Uh, we do have one in November, uh, a general, general election. election. Yeah. We want to make sure people don't uh, take that for granted. Yeah. Uh, so we got to be out there making sure we have folks yeah. coming to the polls. So you, you, you've been an activist, uh, an advocate for, for tenants of people concerned about housing, a city council member, candidate for lieutenant governor. We should mention that. <laughs> got to know people all across the state. Uh, and now you've transitioned to public advocate. Uh, tell me about that evolution, uh, and how does it feel setting up the office now in the in the first few weeks? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I've, I've quite fully embraced it. It's kind of still a shock to the system. Um, you know, a lot of folks have usually when they get elected two or three months to do transition. Uh, I had no time, and so yeah. this is uh, uh, by the time it is maybe around my third or fourth week of uh, officially being a public advocate, so we're still moving forward, uh, getting staff hired up. Uh, to go from a community organizer uh, to a council member to a citywide elected official is just, it's just phenomenal. Yeah. So, uh, are you still an activist, or are you, a, are you, are you a public official, or you're uh, both, or I'm how, do you, a, how do you balance that? I'm an activist elected official, um, and for me, it, it's less of a balanced act than just more of who I am, and I've always felt uh, the best elected officials to me were activists. And so I, I just, you know, use all the tools that I have at my disposal. So yeah. uh, when I can get legislation passed, I do that. Uh, when you need to bully bullpit, I do that. If I need to be in the streets, uh, I'm, I'm ready to do that also. Yeah. Well, when, when you think about the public advocate role and what you've done, I mean, you, you really are so well suited for being the advocate for the people. I mean, other than being ready if the mayor for some reason isn't there to step in, right? That's a possibility. We're not wishing that, but that's a possibility. It really is an office where you determine what the portfolio will be. You'll determine what are the issues that you think are most important to the people and try to make a difference. Yeah, you know, we, um, we, um, we made that same case that this uh, office really suited me. Yeah. Uh, some folks agreed, and so we're excited about that. And we, 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 lay, we laid out what our uh, kind of primary uh, goals were and our issues. Uh, the number one of them was housing. Mm. Uh, and then yeah, talk a little bit more. I mean, every, everybody talks about the affordable housing issue. In Albany now, of course, we have the rent regulations. That, that, you know, that's coming up for uh, renewal and consideration. Uh, the success of the city is wonderful, but, but the prices keep going up. Many people are feeling pushed out of neighborhoods where they've lived for a long time. Give us a sense of where you're, you see that issue headed in 2019. Yeah, I've been working on this for, for two decades. I, mean, I was a tenant organizer. That was where I first I organized my first building uh, in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Mm. Uh, and, and it's an issue that was concerning back then. It's even worse now. Homelessness uh, is at all-time high, and there's a connection between uh, what is affordable to people at certain income levels and, and homelessness. And so, yeah. as you mentioned, the number one thing right now is June and the rent laws that are going to expire. As you mentioned, I had a chance to go around the state, um, and surprisingly or unsurprisingly, issues that we're dealing with here, uh, they look a little different, but the themes are the same, and mm. housing was one of those. Mm. And, and so you have people across the state um, asking for uh, either strengthened or to have some kind of rent protections like we have here in New York City. You know, uh, uh, personally, I think uh, the governor hasn't done well when it comes to uh, tenants. Um, hopefully now with the change in the Senate, uh, we'll have some people who really pushing forward both in the Assembly and the Senate to make sure uh, that we can get to universal rent control, uh, that we can deal with vacancy decontrol, we can deal with MCIs and IAIs, preferential rent, which is ravaging our communities in a very real way, not just lip service. Because mm -hmm. the last time it came up, uh, we got a little lip service, we got nothing. You might even argue 
that it was made worse. Yeah. Um, but, but even when it comes to NYCHA, there, there's huge problems uh, with NYCHA, obviously, uh, in this It's been in, in the, the city. news so much, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I always say, the way I put it, I say, uh, the mayor and the governor, uh, I feel, are playing a, a male measuring contest with 400,000 lives. Mm. And it's unfortunate. I'm, I'm waiting for the governor to release the money that he said he was going to have. Um, the truth is, there are three things we need. We need a dedicated funding stream. We should get it from the federal government, but I don't quite trust them. Mm. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. The state needs to just have dedicate some funds, and a little lesser, but the city. Second, I'm hoping we, we finish seeing the deception of management particularly around lead that I saw with the city administration. Yeah. Um, and third, any plan that we put together with NYCHA has to have the tenant involvement. Their voice has been missing. Mm -hmm. So some of the plan that I've seen makes sense, but if you try to shove honey down someone's throat, they're going to react to it. Mm -hmm. So we have had a tendency of doing things to people instead of doing things with folks. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping the public advocate's office can try to change that. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of people losing their homes to foreclosure. City programs quote-unquote, accidentally stealing people's deeds, mm. uh, which is a huge problem in, in, in Brooklyn. Thankfully, some of them just got them back uh, from the third-party transfer program. So there's a, there's a lot of issues in housing uh, mm. that has to be looked at. And, of course, the rezonings in the cities, which are critical. I'm asking for a moratorium in most rezonings until we look at the mandatory inclusionary housing, which I think mm. has been a failed policy. Many people may not have heard of it, but it's the underpinning of all the rezonings they've heard about in the city, and it's failed to provide the affordability that we need. I've also asked for a racial impact study to be done before rezonings go forward. And, and you're obviously bringing a lot of what you worked on in the council into a broader citywide agenda now. I know uh, you've just been named a winner in city and state again for the success of one of your bills that uh, has now, you know, uh, passed. So, I mean, it seems to me you've really hit the ground running with an agenda that's already there. I mean, housing, big area. Public transit, another big issue that we had in Albany this year. Uh, congestion pricing, hopefully we'll you know, have more money come in for the subways and for the MTA. Uh, New York City schools, what's happening to our, our school children? Another area, certainly I hear from many of our mutual constituents in the city, ongoing concerns there. Uh, will, will education, transit, will those be among your priority areas they, as well? They, they absolutely are. Um, we didn't, I, I don't know if, we're, if we, we were named one of the winners in City State. I don't know if we'll be the top one. <laughs> uh, we'll see. But you know, transportation and uh, education definitely are. By the way, again, when I traveled across the state, they were the same issues that people were speaking about right. in different ways, and you know that yep. because of, of, of what you do. Yep. Um, and, and uh, you know, when it comes to transportation, hashtag Cuomo's MTA, um, which, is, which is just the truth. We, we hopefully will see a different kind of board because it doesn't make sense to continue to throw money at a dysfunctional board. So hopefully we, we work that out. But to the extent that we do, obviously, we need to have a dedicated funding stream. It's been yeah. amusing to me when I travel across the city uh, and I see people who are uh, rejecting congestion pricing. Uh, and I always say, well, the fact of the matter is, every time they need funding, they go to the strap hangers. Mm. And they raise the fears. But we don't go to the people who actually drive cars and are providing the congestion. Yeah. How many of you go to work and drive every single day? Most need nobody raises their hand. Yeah. So people are responding to the idea yeah. of tax, even though it's, it's not going to affect them at all. Yeah. And so you have to, and, I, and I'm a driver. I mean, and so I, I, you know, I've driven a, lot, a long time. So mm. it's unfair not to be going to folks like me mm. uh, who don't have to drive to New York. Yeah. Now, if you have to drive into the city, if you're, if you're elderly and you know, a certain income, we should have that discussion. But if you actually have a choice, um, you know, it, it's something that we, we, we definitely need to do. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to education, obviously, I'm happy that we got uh, an extra billion dollars in aid. Yeah. Um, but we're still owed several billion dollars, so hopefully uh, we'll get that. The issue from the CFA case yeah, from years absolutely. ago and then the, the, uh, the, the downturn, the Great Recession hit, money didn't come, and still trying to play catch up on foundation That's aid. Right. Yeah. And yeah. we've seen a lot of, uh, I call it fuzzy math, uh, trying to say that we have caught up when we actually haven't. Yeah. Um, and then the big issue here in the city now is the SHSAT, uh, which is uh, you know the test to the specialized oh, high school. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, where it's being used to say we can deal with the se segregation. The mayor really did a bad job with this. And, uh, and I went to Brooklyn Tech, so I come from a different kind of uh, uh, point of view. And if it wasn't for that test, I was never a very good student. So. I learned how to cut school in eighth grade. Uh, my grades were never really that good. 
And uh, if it wasn't for that test, I would have my my life would have been different, a different wow. kind of education. I have a friend yeah. who was about to get left back in the eighth grade, uh, but he took the tech test and he passed. So they had no choice but to promote him. He's a very successful mm. attorney right now. And so I always say, I don't think you have to take away access point to add one. And so yeah. there are folks like me who can show what they can do on a test. And there are other people who can show what they do with multiple criteria. Yeah. Let's have both ways of entry. Yeah. You know, why take away one? Yeah. And the other part is the DOE is a system. They keep focusing on the schools that we have least control of. But the mayor has control over the multiple criteria schools right now, like Eleanor Roosevelt, some of the top tiers, who are not more diverse than Stuyvesant. Mm. So why are we looking at one set and not the other? Let's have a discussion around uh, desegregation of schools without pitting communities against each other. There's well, no and that's the concern. I mean, you see that happening yeah. now. And, the, you know, and then you see the focus in the city, the debate in Albany as well, some of the bills pending there. It, there's a lot of heat and perhaps not as much thoughtful discussion about how to deal with it. Yeah. I, I yeah. think the thought was, for whatever reason, maybe the Asian community wouldn't push back. Um, I'm very glad that they did, yeah. and their voice is critically important. Yeah. And you know, as public advocate, I'm not going to allow us to pit black and Latino community against the Asian community when everybody's just trying to do the best they yeah. can for their Divide children. Divide and conquer always, uh, in the long run, hurts everybody. Yeah, it's a fact. We only have a couple of moments left, but um, you know, you have a big agenda, and and in past administrations, the public advocate's office, the the, the budget was cut, making it harder to do the job. With everything you're trying to accomplish. Do you have the resources to, to be the kind of public advocate you want to be, or is that going to be a, a, an issue that you've got to fight with the, not fight, let's say, uh, request uh, and work with the city council and the mayor to make sure you have adequate staff to do your job? So I've never heard someone say that they have all the money that they need to get, <laughs> true, right? get their job, so I'm not going to say that. I, I came into the job prepared to do the best we can for the people of the city of New York. Uh, to, the, to the extent uh, that we, we say we're going to do something, we're going to do it. Uh, as we're learning now and going through the process, I don't think the budget is enough uh, to do what we need to do. So we do need to, one, have an independent budget. Uh, we need to have subpoena power. And we do need an increase in the budget that is there now. How are you managing your time? Uh, it's not just being in Brooklyn and City Hall. You've got five boroughs now. And uh, as much as you've gotten to know people running for lieutenant governor, running for public advocate, I know my experience when I first became a statewide official, I couldn't believe how many people I still had to meet, how many neighborhoods I hadn't been in. How are you managing covering the, this very vast and, and diverse metropolis we call New York City? I got to tell you that when i running across the state, for it, people are surprised to hear it was a l even a little easier than running across the city. Mm. Because when you're in Buffalo, nobody expected you to be in Brooklyn. <laughs> but when you are in the bottom of Queens, you're expected to be on the top of Bronx and to the east and west of the city all at the same time. Yeah. Uh, so the energy's there. But you know, it's, uh, you know, I'm born and bred right here in New York City, and so the energy is something that I'm used to. Uh, this city is amazing. You can uh, see cultures from all over the world, and so I do very much enjoy that. But the, the answer is yes, everybody expects to see you uh, every place at the same time. But that is a job that we both applied yeah. for. Yeah. We actually begged for it a few times. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm excited that people gave me the opportunity to do it. And I'm going to do the best job for the people of the city. Well, you're off to an incredible start. And you are a New York City and American success story. You're first generation here, right? Your parents were immigrants? Yeah, my parents came from a small island named Grenada. Yeah. I'm very proud of, of, of that heritage. But it's a pure immigration story. Yeah. So I'm very proud of that. Yeah. I can only imagine knowing their story what it would be like if the English wasn't their first language. Yeah. So I always try to empathize uh, when people are struggling through, through different issues. Yeah, yeah. My grandparents were the immigrants, and, and like your parents, they, they ended up in Brooklyn. That's where they oh. put their roots down. I always say Brooklyn is uh, for them. the borough of dreams and where a lot begins. And, uh, and there you are. Your dream is coming true, and all of New York City is going to benefit from it. We're just at, about out of time. I want to thank you, Public Advocate Jumani Williams, for being with us. I've enjoyed working with you over the years when you were on the council. If there's any way that our offices can collaborate, you know, we have a lot of reports and information about New York City, and if any of that can help you and your team in uh, discharging your important responsibilities, we're very anxious to work with you. And you're just off to a great start, and you're, you, you are Mr. going Comptroll. to be an outstanding public advocate, and any way we can help you and support you, we're there, we're there to do that. Looking forward. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Well, Jumani, thank you, Mr. Public Advocate, Mr. Activist Public Advocate, Jumani Williams. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, we're going to take uh, a little bit of a break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Represent NYC. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. My next guest, Mario Russell, works every day to assist the men, women, and children 
struggling to enter the United States, often under the most challenging circumstances. As director of Catholic Charities of New York's Immigrant and Refugee Services, he is a first-hand witness to the immigration crisis our country is grappling with and its impact right here in New York. Mario, thank you so much for joining me today. We had the chance to meet uh, this week when I visited uh, the office right there, right down the block from my office on Maiden Lane, uh, and to see firsthand uh, as a visitor what you deal with each and every day. Uh, the newspaper, the news stories, always uh, issues of immigration, national policy, what's happening in our own community. Uh, wow, given where you sit, just give an overall sense uh, for our viewers right here in New York City what you see happening here in the greater New York metro area. What's the impact of this issue and all these folks, refugees and immigrants, trying to get into this country? How are we dealing with it? What's Catholic Charities doing? How's that for a very broad <laughs> opening to a very complex topic and issue? Thank you, Tom. Uh, and thank you for having me here. It's really a pleasure, and it was a pleasure to have you in our office just the other day. I'll start with this. You know, eight months ago, I got a call at my house on Wednesday night at about 11 o'clock from Sister Elizabeth up in the Bronx, who said that a gentleman, and I'll make his name up in the name of Natalio, had gone to her convent asking for help. And what he was asking for help for was for his family, seven United States citizen children under the age of 15 and his undocumented wife. And what he was saying was, I am required to go check in with ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, tomorrow morning. And I need to go. I'm gonna go. I've been here for 15, 20 years. I have an old deportation order that under the prior administrations, I was allowed to stay mm -hmm. and check in every year. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but I don't want ICE coming to my home. What can you do? So she calls me, 11 mm -hmm. o'clock at night. The best I could do was to speak with him and assemble a team of lawyers who met him the next morning at seven o'clock. They arrested him, put him in handcuffs, sent him to New Jersey. That was on July 25th, 2018. His family was left stranded, seven children, two of them with psychosocial issues, mm. seven U.S. citizen children, a wife was undocumented, struggling to make everything work in a state of absolute crisis. He's from Mexico. We begged and pleaded with ICE that morning, the 26th, asking for mercy, asking for more time, asking for a sense of justice around a family that has been here for 15 years or more, a family that has no criminal record, has never taken public benefits and has paid taxes, mm. and is almost entirely made up of US citizens. Zero, zero tolerance, zero mercy, this is it. So. The team of lawyers had to follow him to New Jersey. We've been doing habeas corpus petitions. We've been filing motions and appeals. Just last week, we got him out. Wow. But the point is, that's what we're seeing. There is a comprehensive, basically, attack on the immigrant community, on the community of newcomers, on the community of, of migrants and refugees who have for years sought to find a place and to make this country a better place. Mm -hmm. And it is a policy, written and unwritten, that is inflexible, uh, that is inhumane, that fails really to understand reality. And it is enforcing laws in a way that is, you know, as though basically you're treating an adolescent or punishing a child. Mm. You're not, they, the administration, is not looking at this in a mature sense to say, who are we? What is right? What is the right place? for law and mercy and justice and a comprehensive immigration reform. So use that as an example, yeah. a very small example. You know, the detention and deportation of these kinds of breadwinners in New York, these men mm. who've worked here to make New York better, mm -hmm. has gone up 265% in the last two years. Wow. We need to be at that crossroads, at that junction. Um, so what we're seeing really kind of rhetorically and what you have brought up you know, about the questions of, I suppose, the border, uh, policy, what's the right direction. I think what's happening is that the administration has engaged a response that is looking at the application of law as though immigration were an adolescent issue, mm. not a question that deserves a mature sense 
of how to respond to a grown-up problem and to a grown-up phenomenon and to a grown-up opportunity and gift. Mm -hmm. Now, it, would it be fair to say that, that because I assume many of these families are, are in the shadows of, of daily life, Correct. is, is, is the, the moment when many of them reach out to Catholic Charities for support, and you're an attorney, that's your background, and it's wonderful you specialized in this area, is it when the issues come up with law and status that, that people will call and reach out? I'm sure there are so many other needs, whether Absolutely. it's housing, uh, em employment, medical, I mean, what is, sure. but is it the legal? Well, challenges that often bring you absolutely. I mean, that, clients that tends in? to be the beginning yeah. of the narrative. Yeah, you know, it's sort of the 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 head of the spear, the point of the spear, of what yeah. brings and drives people to really say, "I have to move forward." But then, of course, when you engage with human beings and people who are indigent or poor or struggling or trying to build something, you realize they have questions of literacy, knowledge of English, how to communicate with doctors, how to access health, yeah. housing food, um, all of those things. So what we have tried to do is, as folks come to us for help, how much can we assess, determine, and help on all of these fronts? And so what we do is we have our case management support, our integration specialists who can also say, let me help you with rent, such as that family. Yeah. Right? That family was in crisis, so we had to help them with rent for a number of months. Yeah. So really, it is a holistic problem. Yeah. But I think, I think today, what we've seen really since November 9th, 2016, the day after the election, what we saw was a spike in everything. Mm. Calls to our office, calls to the hotline, calls for emergency assistance. We did, we did over 300 community events in New York City and in the lower Hudson Valley, which is where Catholic Charities does its work, yeah. um, to just reach out to folks, to help them understand due process issues, status issues, um, you know, what to do yeah. if an officer comes to your house or what to do if you're stopped in the street. And people ask us very prosaic questions, Tom, mm. but that are core yeah. to living daily life. They say things such as, should we go to church together, mm. mom and dad? Mm. Should we go shopping for food together? Mm. This is an anxiety that people experience every day. Yeah. A lady came into our office. She had dyed her hair from black to blonde. And we asked her, Maria, what, what's the occasion? She says, I need to look a little more American. Mm. It, the challenges are overwhelming, and, I, and for me to see the number of, of, of people that you were servicing was just incredible on that very busy day. Uh, we are so fortunate that the New York Archdiocese, under the leadership of, of Cardinal Dolan and uh, Monsignor Kevin Sullivan from Catholic Charities, there's such a commitment of resources. I mean, it would overwhelm government if, if government just had to do this. Uh, so you and your expanded team there, you have so many colleagues that do this very important work. Uh, and as you know, as a follow-up, mm -hmm. uh, I'm traveling with Monsignor Sullivan and, and Stuart Applebaum from RWDSU to the Northern Triangle, right. countries of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, because we want to see what is driving this continued uh, migration and the challenge that's happening. And, and one of the piece I'd like you to just talk about again, because it's been so much in the, in the news, the issue of, of the unaccompanied minors. Yeah. How is that playing out in, in New York? It's one thing when that gentleman that you mentioned gave you a call, what happens when an unaccompanied minor ends up on the streets of New York, and, right. and how, can, how can they end up uh, getting the support that Catholic Charities provides? And these unaccompanied minors, as you will find um, in your visit, which we're delighted you're doing, um, is so much, you know, their movement north is so much the result of both leaving conditions of extreme social, political, and legal dysfunction in their home countries, so that the abuse, violence, threats of gangs, threats, threats of sexual assault, and persecution are so real that the old structures can't work for them anymore and they need to leave. The grandma that used to take care of the kids or the older sister of the relative in New York who used to take care of that child says, I can't do this anymore. So these children now are much more on the move in the last basically 10 to 15 years. But what they're doing that we don't get to talk about it is also coming to be with a relative in the United States, mm. to be with a parent, mother, father, godparent, maybe a cousin or a brother. So it is a family unification, and we feel that this is so key to understanding this phenomenon. These are children who want to come to be in a place that's safe where they can build and produce. They all want to go to school. 
They all want to work. They all have a dream. Mm. It's fascinating. Catholic Charities has been working with the unaccompanied minors for over 15 years. We've helped over 35, almost 40,000 kids. And what we do is we meet with every child that is transferred from the southern border who has presented him or herself to immigration. Now, these are kids who are anywhere from two years old to 17. And they're transferred by plane to one of nine facilities that do shelter care in the New York region or foster care, temporary foster mm -hmm. care. We meet with every child. So, you know, in a given year, anywhere between five or 6,000 children to do a legal consultation, a know your rights orientation, and legal representation in the immigration court um, where kids are released into New York. And again, kids are released into New York to be with their parents, mm -hmm. to be with their, again, godparent or older brother. Um, so what's key to this is not only legal intervention and, and legal assistance, which, as you've mentioned, you know, has been incredibly well supported by New York State and New York City, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say we need more, mm -hmm. because more is needed. Yeah. But um, what's key again is how do we support these kids who are vulnerable, who uh, maybe have difficulties in school, maybe have social issues, and over 75% have experienced trauma in their home country or on the road to America, yeah. and they need help. Well, part of that help is um, getting in touch with you. <laughs> so you have a toll-free number that I want to get out there, the, the New Americans Hotline, uh, funded by New York State, uh, Office of New Americans and Catholic Charities, a joint effort. I got to see the, uh, the folks who were staffing the phones over 200 languages uh, are, are spoken by the, by the operators who can answer. But that toll-free number uh, we want our viewers to know is 1-800-566-7636. 1-800-566-7636. Uh, Mario has been uh, talking about some very important issues, so I hope if, if some of you have questions or know of somebody who needs help, uh, please call that 800 number and be in touch. Uh, we only have a few months left, but you, you know, offline before we started the interview, you said something that I thought really summed it up as uh, you know, the grand, uh, grandson of immigrants who came mm -hmm. here to New York. Do you remember what you said about, um, about a certain island and when, you know, what, what's happening there at, at 80 Maiden Lane? Uh, yeah. that, that'll be our final word for the segment. You know, one of the things that we do at Catholic Charities every Thursday, we have a community legal clinic, and we see probably about 100 immigrants who come in the morning. And what I've seen over the years, you know, is just the sense of the beauty, the diversity uh, of nationality, ethnicity, language, races in that room, in our office, all there. And I think to myself, we're not probably more than 800 yards from Ellis Island. Yeah. This is our Ellis Island. Yeah. And I have to say, I'm so honored to be able to do this work in New great, York great. because we bring and invite and give hope to Great. thousands of people. Thank you for doing it. Thank Pleasure. you to you and your team. Thanks, Mary, for your time. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we've run out of time, but I hope we've provided some very thoughtful discussion of issues that affect New York City. Thank you for joining me today, Mario. Really, great guests. I hope we can continue this very important conversation, uh, and uh, we'll have to report back after Monsignor we'll Sullivan and I return, and we'll talk about it. My thanks also to public advocate Jumani Williams for sharing his insights with us today. I'm New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. Thank you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network.